Dr. Shackleton, it is always a joy to talk to another friend. And uh, we've both been in Boulder for a long time. I think you've been here longer than I have. Um, but welcome to our live show. And I'm so glad to talk to you today about environmental toxicity. Um, before Thank we you. start, just a few housekeeping for everybody listening. And then I want to introduce Dr. Shackleton. Um, basics are, you can find me on my website, jillcarnahan.com, tons of free resources there. Um, drjillhealth.com is the retail store. And if you need any information or questions, those are um, always available. We also have a brand new YouTube channel. If you just search my name under YouTube, you'll see all of these videos and more, lots of fun stuff with friends and lots and lots of great topics. It's all free. So go there and, uh, and just um, subscribe if you like. So today I have an awesome friend and just someone I respect so much because we just have such parallel practices in Boulder, Colorado, and a lot of the types of people that we see. And we both have a few stories around some of this environmental toxicity that we'll share today. Um, this will be recorded. So if you miss the first part or want to share it later, you can. It'll be on the Facebook page as well. So Dr. Shackleton, I want to introduce you. Um, first, she is a naturopathic doctor who practices environmental medicine with an emphasis on women's health. She's a member of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine with a focus on chronic disease, conditions associated with environmental toxic exposure, and chronic hidden infections, such as Lyme, mixed bacterial infections, and immune dysfunction. She has a blog in which she writes about her passion for the environment and its impact on human health. Um, where can they find that? What's your website, Dr. Shackleton? MaryShackleton.com is where my blog is, and then they can also find me at HolisticaCare.com. Awesome. Very good. And we'll mention that again at the end and we'll say about what she's been up to and what's upcoming in her life. Um, well, here it is. She's just completed writing a book on the impact of environmental toxins on neurodegenerative disorders in the unborn fetus. I am really excited to get to that topic because a lot of people don't really think they just, oh, I'm pregnant. This is great. But right. they think about that pre-care. Right. Um, so we will dive into that as well. I love to start though with kind of story and I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you got interested in medicine and your path to this career. Well, that's a good question. It was circuitous for sure. I started kind of dabbling in medicine, didn't feel like it was the right course for me, ended up getting a master's in public health. That never felt like the right fit for me at the time. Either I was working in the wrong public health department, I'm not sure, but then literally, you know, when the lightning bolt strikes and you go, that's it. I saw a poster on, um, on a phone pole, really. And it was advertising Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine, doctorate degree, four years. And I never knew you could get a degree in naturopathic medicine. And so for me, it was a slam dunk. I was, I had all my pre med uh, prereqs done. I couldn't wait to be done. And it really started for me the the love of my life, which is practicing naturopathic medicine. And it really has been, um, it was made for me. So I love going to work every day. I am always um, much more energized when I get home from having seen patients. And I love the complexity of what's happening. And that's part of what um, inspired this book was realizing that, you know, there's so much happening in the environment and it's impacting women's health pretty significantly. So it's like, what can I do about this? And this book was born from that kind of question. Wow. I love that. And you've been in, have you been in Boulder your whole life? Did you? Uh, no, I moved here in 99. So I've been, I've had my practice here for about 22 years and you know, it's wonderful working here with people that are extremely knowledgeable about their health and interested and motivated. And then there's a lot of people here that are not well. So it does, it's a great place to work and live. I couldn't agree more. Um, gosh, mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting to be here among, again, most of our patients, I always joke, because in Illinois, you know, you'd have people on three, two liters of Diet Coke per day uh -huh. and McDonald's, yeah. and I rarely see people that aren't already doing 80% of what they need with healthy diet and lifestyle. So that makes it easy because the foundation, there's yeah. definitely tweaks, right? Because some people need a little help with, they still diet's kind of a core of what we do, but a lot of times at least they have the basic like healthy yes. lifestyle there. So. And I attribute the, the internet to a lot of that. You know, there's, there was a time that the internet wasn't as accessible and we, I was really teaching a lot of basic foundational stuff. Now people have, they know so much before they sit down. I used to have a um, talk, a live um, talk radio show mm -hmm. and the questions that would come, this was 99, 2000. 
And those questions were really from educated healthcare consumers. And I loved it, but even more so now people can access anything online. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And given the knowledge that they come. So um, right now, uh, first of all, let's go through what's happened recently a little bit. How has that affected your practice, your patients that are coming in? You're probably doing more virtual than before. Um, Tell me just a little bit about how the shift in your practice has happened through this pandemic. Right. Oh, it was, you know, so touch and go in the beginning. We have a lot of cancer patients that are, some that are getting their chemo through our office and Um, really immunocompromised. So we decided to stay open only for those folks and really not let anybody else in the clinic. So those were big decisions in late March, early April. And then um, everything went online, all all patient appointments. And I realized, wow, we really can do a lot online. (laughs) um, But you have IV, so tell us more about, so you offer, what different types of IVs are you offering? We have, um, goodness, um, Myers cocktails, uh, amino acids, alpha lipoic acid, IV curcumin, um, phosphatidylcholine, glutathione, ozone, and we also have a laser. So we have a lot of different things. I might be leaving a few things out, but we do a lot of, a lot, we can address most things with that complement of IVs. So we stayed open for really only a handful of cancer patients, not even the folks that wanted to do immune support. We just said no, because we couldn't control um, everyone's exposure. So now we are um, still pretty much online, seeing some patients, but really have to keep the clinic to less than 10 people. And we have one IV per room where we used to have three in a room. So we're spreading it out and getting people in as we can. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing how, you know, with the IVs, because you've got to have them in person, right? We did the same. Well, we both mostly went virtual and just didn't do a lot of IVs. We didn't have people that had critical needs. Mm -hmm. So we were able, and we have a much smaller IV, um, you know, population than you do. So, um, and we did all Zoom for a while and then got back live and it was really no big deal. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, same thing, there's a limited amount that come in the office. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about for sure was, uh, gosh, the impact. We're ta- we've talked about the virus and the impact of that on human health and everything, but what people are not talking about, and I think is maybe a bigger issue, is number one, social isolation and that effect mm-hmm. on the immune system and health. And then mental health of our kids and our young adults, I mean, even our adults, what are the effects? Are you seeing people with more issues with mental health or more issues with anxiety? Yeah. Yes, I'm actually kind of surprised because I started to really get curious with patients to just ask every single person, how are you doing and what, how has this impacted your life? And I was shocked to, to understand the, the depth of anxiety that people are experiencing. And I think part of it is the isolation. I think I didn't even realize the full impact of social isolation on my own self. And I imagine that, you know, everybody's experiencing their own thing. So I think that people are actually really terrified of getting this virus. And, um, and ev- there are so many different sides of this, co- this entire experience that it's, compl- it's very complex. And so, um, you know, they might have had chronic asthma as a kid yeah. and been fine for 20 years, but this is a real trigger for them. So they're triggered around their health and they're isolating. I have a patient that's a you know, living in the mountains by himself because he's so afraid of contact with other people. And then to answer your question about how it's affecting our immune system, our immune systems learn by contact with viruses and bacteria. And so, you know, we are, you know, you can take a certain amount of supplements, but that doesn't create antibodies to infection. And that's what we need. And so kids kids are good at that. They're getting exposed all the time and their immune systems can be fairly robust. And yet adults, we are, we, our immune systems are not getting exposed or seeing any infection. So we're not giving it the chance to learn how to respond. So it's, and, and yet it's very complicated. You know, this, we do need to stay home for a little bit longer and we do need to wear masks and we do need to wash our hands. And I, I you know, the whole concept of hand sanitizer, I've written so many blogs about no, don't use hand sanitizer because we want these microbes. Yes. Now the tr- the trickless sand, which is actually re- re- related to reduced fertility, um, I just keep seeing these hand sanit you know gallon size hand sanitizers. Every- and I you know it's like we just are all on a point of surrender for now. We have to surrender. Um, you bring that up because the trickless. I can't even say it. <laughs> the, the trickless tr- sand. Yeah. Um, say that again so everybody hears Trickless you. sand. Trickless uh-huh. sand. Thank you. Trickless mm-hmm. sand. So this is toxic. Tell us a little bit more about that toxicity. So they found that this was responsible for infertility in, in a lot of women. And trickless sand is an endocrine disrupting hormone that's found in most major brands of hand sanitizer. So 
it, you know, endocrine disruptors are things that get into our bodies. They look like hormones. They confuse uh, hormone messaging. And, um, you know, the daily use of a hand sanitizer is just going to contribute to this complex hormonal confused messaging. So, but at this time, I keep telling patients, you know what, we're going to just follow the rules for now. <laughs> we're going to wear our masks and use our hand sanitizer. We're going to wash our hands and just do it. It's not forever. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the, the pep talk I've given patients is just, you know, do what you need to do to protect yourself mentally and emotionally from this and be as careful as you can. I love that balance though, because that's where I'm at. I'm not uh, saying that any of the regulations are wrong or bad or any of that is we need to do what we need to do. I'm washing my mm -hmm. office down between patients. I'm doing right. all the precautions like you are, yes. but the truth is I know that our microbiome live, inhabits our space and our body and our skin mm -hmm. and our mouth. And our, so there's all of these places. And I just wonder, I saw a commercial the other day for United and Clorox, and they were so proud of this collaboration between United and Clorox. And they mm -hmm. showed these people in the, you know, they were fuming the planes and they were just pouring the chloride and I thought oh for our, for our chemically sensitive patients this is going to be oh. a nightmare to oh. start to travel with the chemicals right in the planes and again it's, they're doing the, they're trying to do the right thing but um, for example, you have a two-year-old in the garden grabbing a dirty carrot and you know eating that that's how their their immune system yes. is trained yes. as yes. to what dangerous and what's good like right. our contact with dirt as children is actually training for our immune systems and mm -hmm. then as we get to be adults the contact with germs on a constant basis is how our immune system detects good versus evil right right so i agree with you i'm like how in the world in a year or two or more maybe a decade probably a lot less than that we're going to see the manifestations of this trial of sterilization of our environment, which is really, really quite unhealthy for us. It is. I think it's also an opportunity to really talk about, um, you know, there's a lot being taken away from us mm -hmm. right now, but I think there's also a, a huge opportunity to have a conversation about what is in our control and yeah. what's in our control is what we put in our mouth, what we, how we, uh, what we choose to eat. And, um, you know, there's no substitute for a good diet. You cannot take supplements and have like superimpose that on an unhealthy diet. So I think, you know, as we all have read that the comor comorbidity, the patients with comorbidities are the ones that are at highest risk from dying from COVID. And so this is an opportunity to get our, get, you know, to rein in our health, to, to lower our inflammation with good diet, to exercise, to reduce our weight, to reduce our hypertension. This is the best time that we're ever going to have and the best reason that we have to ever do the, to enact some personal changes in our, in our own behaviors because it's protective. Yeah, I love that because a lot of times I talk about, you know, the germ theory was years ago and it's still real. There's germs and they uh -huh. cause illness, but the new theory is terrain because if we have a healthy terrain that we live in and inhabit and we choose to do things like clean air, clean water, clean food, weight loss or appropriate, you know, food intake and all those kinds of things that we can do, we really do have more control than we think. And yes, there's this fine line between fear and between taking control of what we can control. Um, yeah. One thing you mentioned that I think is important too is, like you said, the, the mental health of isolation. We're seeing, at least for me, I'm seeing younger mm -hmm. kids and stuff and the whole school debate. I won't get into how I feel about that. I just, I have a lot of compassion for those of you who are parents mm -hmm. and dealing with decisions and all of that. And you mentioned you're going to take your kids on the road a little bit more. Um, yeah. I mean, the last 10 weeks of school were a disaster in my house watching you know, my son is 17 and he had one screen with his video game and one screen oh. with his teacher. Unbelievable. I, you know, total disengagement, nothing I could do about it. I was busy trying to keep yeah. my own business afloat. My husband was doing the same thing. So I just knew when I knew the schools were not going to start uh, in person learning um, because just watching the numbers rise. And so we really kind of have planned um, to do some online classroom time in the outdoors. And again, I feel like the outdoors are very healing for us and great for our immune system. So if you can walk outside barefoot, you can actually absorb the vibration of the earth. And that's very, um, it's the counterbalance to EMFs and being on a computer. So I'm going to really hope that we can find some good adventures where we can also do, you know, several hours of classroom time 
I'm going to try to figure out how I'm going to work it for my schedule, but I'll figure it out. But that's, that's kind of our strategy. And while not everyone can do that, I know, but um, I really want to say to parents, um, had, I've had this conversation over and over with my best friend who's a social worker in high school, that, you know, every parent is struggling. If you feel like you are failing at X, Y, or Z right now, just know every single mother and father are feeling the exact same way. This is so unprecedented and nobody really knows what to do. And I just really believe that everybody's doing the best they can. And that's kind of been the refrain in my mind when something feels frustrating or I don't understand it or I can't, I can't tolerate it. It's like everybody really is just trying to do the best they can. And some people need to give themselves a lot of permission to not be perfect right now and just to get the other side. I love that. I think that's something just to pause on. Like we are, we're doing the best we can and whether yeah. you're anxious or sad or overwhelmed or depressed or those mm-hmm. things, it's, there is this, we really need for compassion instead of judgment and instead of yeah. all this stuff that's happening on the other end. I think that's so important. And even for yeah. pictures, just to create a space where they can be where they're at. And, um, you know, it's funny because there's a lot of, I've talked about this before, but the things that raise cortisol are novelty, unpredictability, mm-hmm. threat to ego, and sense of control. And we're kind of engaging all four of those right now, right? Yeah. So it's uh, it's definitely stressful on all of us. I think just the unpredictability and the yeah. unknown, right? Yeah, humans don't do well with uncertainty. I'm certainly one of those people. Right, me too. I like the plan. <laughs> Um, well, let's talk about, so you wrote last year and hopefully that'll be published very soon. Um, but I know how this goes with COVID and, and my own book and writing, things are a little up in the air with the publishers. Tell us about your upcoming book um, and a little bit more because I want to dive into that topic. I think people will find it really interesting. Okay. So I wrote a book on environmental toxicity and how to prevent having a baby on the autism spectrum. And the genesis of the book really came from seeing woman after woman plot down in my chair in my exam room and say, I want to have a baby next month and I want to do a detox this month. Wow. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. So the, the thinking is that, you know, if we think of like having a baby as a marathon, the first 18 to 20 miles really should be planning for conception. Yeah. So detoxing, looking at your personal environment, what can you do to clean out what we've stored and then not put any more in. And that's a process and it takes some time. So if you get this, I also think of the detox machine like a wheel. If you get it spinning and then get pregnant, that baby will be exposed to everything you've now unrooted or pulled out of hiding. And so the the goal really is to have a good year, 12 months to detox before you get pregnant. It will increase your chances of having a healthy baby. It will increase your fertility, um, increase the chances of your brain, of the baby's brain being neurologically intact. So it's a concept that I really want women in their early fertile years to grasp because their fertility is affected greatly by what's happening in the environment. And what's happening in the environment is happening so rapidly that it's impacting our genes. It's impacting um, the way we are actually having babies. I think there was something like 20,000 babies born to IVF in 1998 and in 2012 it went to, to 60,000. Wow. So it's, that's not going to change. And part of that is the environment. Of course, not all of it, but part of that is due to environmental changes. So this is so interesting because I can go back to a little bit of my story, with, which is a 25 years old breast cancer. And mm-hmm. there's no doubt um, that I had in utero exposure to toxic uh, endocrine mm-hmm. disruptors on the farm. So mm-hmm. atrazine and organophosphates, oh. right? I mean, classic. Yes. And if I looked, I remember this was like 10 years after my di- diagnosis when I was in remission, but I remember looking up atrazine, really understanding it, and then realizing it's banned in Europe, but in Illinois and in the United States, it's still being used and being like, oh my goodness, how in the world is this chemical, which we know is so toxic, still being used? And then I'm like, well, let's see where the concentration of use is. And I looked up map of the United States and atrazine use. And I literally fell off my chair, Mary, because right in the hottest red spot of the use was where I grew up, like the Whoa. like a little bubble of red that was solid, a solid oh, can be. just got the chills. Yeah, right in the yeah. Central Illinois farmland. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's no doubt. And we had a well with well water. So there's probably, you know, there's so many things I could talk about, but talk about in utero. So I have no doubt. My mother had migraines, chronic fatigue, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And I remember being really depleted. She had five children and I was oh. a second. So- <laughs> Yeah, this, I mean, there's so many things now. And I also, one little thing that I also didn't put together till a lot recently was I had precocious puberty at five, which means oh. breastbud development went away. Pediatrician was like, no big deal. 
duh, that's when the breast tissue had this estrogenic effect. And I think it was probably starting in utero. So had my mom known, she didn't know any better and she was doing the best she could. Mm -hmm. um, and now my family is one of the first families in Illinois that is organic soy and corn and all non-GMO. So wow. I'm excited that my experiences are actually trans admitted, you know, to the farming community and yeah. made changes there. But That's, does it make sense as you're talking about toxicity in my own breast cancer in what you're right. talking Oh, yes. And atrazine in particular is interesting because they've studied frogs with exposure to atrazine and they exhibit both male and female reproductive characteristics. So males can actually have ovaries, males can have babies. So it's confusing the entire hormone messaging system. And so how can we really even expect to have a baby on the first attempt or a healthy baby if we don't really try to um, reduce our exposures somehow. Yeah, so important. And again, my mom was doing the best she could. Um, yeah. Nowadays, she's done you know, detox. She knows all about that. But I think mm -hmm. if, if we could have caught a young mother like that and had her go through a year of detox like you're recommending, it might have made a difference in a cancer of a 25-year-old woman, which doesn't seem possible, but totally related in my mind. Oh, mine too, for sure. And the other thing that you mentioned, which is interesting, is that um, multiple children in one family, that last baby, unless the mother is very intentional about putting nutrients back in, that last baby gets the least of, uh, amount of nutrients. So in terms of essential fatty acids and minerals and all these things that are really important for neural development. So that's another thing about preconception planning. Is this your first baby or your fourth? If it's your fourth, you really need to, you know, these nutrients that we take orally are really critical. Is there any recommendations if a patient, if a you know woman is planning kind of her family about timing between pregnancies or tips on that? Well, I don't know about that. I think it's more, I mean, certainly a year to give yeah. your body to recover. And in that year, definitely stay on your prenatal vitamin D, probiotic, fish oil, because those are all really important nutrients to feed your cells, get your cell membranes back to being really resilient. Um, those are the big ones. And then dietarily, absolutely dark green leafy vegetables, eggs, if you can tolerate them, um, grass fed protein, um, animal meat, if you can tolerate and like that. Um, so those, those nutrients are really, really important to, to re replenish. I mean, it's not just like you have your baby, but that takes right. a lot out of a woman. It takes a lot. And then you nurse, I mean, that's a 600 to 800 calories a day that you're expending to keep another human alive. So you really have to be intentional and get some support around that. Yeah, gosh, I love that. And uh, what, so say someone does come to you and say, I want to get pregnant in a couple of years. What should I do now? What would you do? What kind of workup or testing or what would you do for that woman? That's great. Um, I would do genetic testing for sure. I would look at their MTHFR status because if that were a problem that we'd know we have to kind of back up and do maybe even a little bit extra detox for this person that shuts down phase two detoxification in the liver. I would do a nutrient panel for sure, just to see, you know, where, where is it looking? And then I would kind of do a clinical intake with them and figure out what their risk of exposure is. Do they, did they grow up on a farm? Did their grandmother grow up on the farm? We do know about transgenerational, um, toxic um, exposure. So your grandmother also probably had some toxins that she gave to your mother that she gave to you. So doing an entire family history is often really illuminating to see what, where are your potential risks and what can we do now? Um, heavy metals, uh, stool testing, depending on how they're doing, because the microbiome really is critical and that we share, women share that with their babies as they come through the vaginal birth canal. So um, knowing if your microbiome, and I I don't know about you, but we probably rarely see anybody with an intact microbiome these exactly. days. But it's a good teaching tool for people to see. This is why diversity in your diet is so important. This is why, you know, avoiding all the things that deplete the microbiome are really important. So that's kind of a and, and certainly blood work. Yeah, certainly gosh, I love that. And I love the gut that you talked about because it really is inoculation of the baby through the mm -hmm. vaginal birth canal and C-section babies. A lot of um, midwives and uh, holistic practitioners are actually inoculating. Um, mm -hmm. with vaginal fluids in the baby that are newborn because it's such a key to get that ingestion of the microflora. Yes, I really encourage people. I mean, if they have, the goal is to have a baby, right? So whether you can have it vaginally or not, okay, you have to surrender at some point. But if you don't, to really advocate for yourself to do a vaginal swab um, for the baby's mouth, because that's really, really important. I couldn't agree. For more. life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's incredible if you think about how we're designed. I mean, it's that that is like such an incredible design. It really is. It's, it's crazy fascinating. And, you know, the studies that I've done, looked at on C-section babies, they may never completely, now, first of all, granted, there's emergencies and we want to have a healthy baby. So right. I have no problem with C-sections, but right. if it's scheduled around the OB's golf 
schedule, maybe that's not a good idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, because what we see is we see these C-section babies have a different flora from birth and it may never completely regain to that of a vaginally born infant. So there's much more like skin flora, like staph and strep and those in the baby's uh, gut versus our typical bifidobacter and lactobacillus. Yeah, I usually see like a lack of lactobacillus with a C-section baby for life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? So I always ask, I'm sure you do too, when your patients, I think they could be, you know, eight or 18 or 80. And I'm like, so how were you born? You know, was it vaginal or C-section? Were you breast or bottle fed? Because those are important, even if they're in their 70s or 80s. Yeah, I know, it's fascinating. Yeah, so you would do the testing and then you would probably get them on some nutrition if they want to do detox and they're not trying, would you tell them to potentially wait to actively try to get pregnant while they do the detox? Tell us more about yes, that. Yes, I would. I would. So first, I want to always make sure that their five pathways of elimination are open. Are they sweating when they exercise or if they sit in a sauna? How long does it take them to sweat? If it takes more than 20, 25 minutes, then they say, oh, okay, then your, your sweating mechanism is weak. Um, how are your bowel movements? One a day is a minimum. Mm -hmm. ideally three per day. It's a major way of uh, getting toxins out of the body. How's the liver looking, looking at certain genes potentially that govern uh, phase one, phase two detoxification, kidney, are you thirsty? Do you have a lot of urination um, and, um, and lymphatic? So if they don't exercise, then we know that that's, that's a hindrance to moving toxins out of the body as well. So I always make sure those five pathways are, are discussed and addressed. Um, and then what was your question? Sorry. Um, so that, that's perfect. That was kind of it is like, how would you okay. start with someone who is in, yeah. or, let's say you were going to take them through detox. You obviously check those pathways mm -hmm. and say, you know, let's not plan on trying getting pregnant for the next six to 12 months. You said mm -hmm. ideally 12 months, right? Ideally. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they have the time, which is why, you know, I really want to get this book in the hands of young women so they can plan because they're already planning. They're planning around their fertility by using birth yeah. control. And so they can plan to wean off of that and detox and give themselves enough time. Cause there is a, you know, there these women are, uh, you know, educated, they've gone to school, they've, they've created a career, they want to have a baby when they want to have a baby. And I'm always saying, I want you to have a baby when you have a baby, but not if it's not safe for you. And you might not have as much control over that if you're full of toxins, actually. Yes. Is there anything particular you've seen? Um, I mean, I've seen different things and, and I'd love to, but I want to hear you for autism is on the rise massively. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I loved in your bio because you said something I've always uh, thought, you know, toxic load, infectious burden is at the core of what we do, right? Yes. And I think when we talk about autism, it's that those systems that are like the weak links of, you know, one in a thousand kiddos that have poor detox and you load them with toxic load and you see this weakness and it can manifest as this communicative disorder with autism. But tell me more about what kinds of things you see that contribute to that diagnosis. Um, definitely the mother's history. And so um, I think the MTHFR gene is really key. It is, um, it is really key for phase two detox. It's one of the four steps. And if that is, um, is if that's working at 70% or even 30% with a double SNP, then that is a huge risk for autism. So we want to address that and give a lot of folate and B12 um, for neural development and autism is modifiable. So mm -hmm. once somebody has a diagnosis that you can actually change that, but you have to really work hard to get that brain to be less inflamed and to actually let that brain detox. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely look at um, all those factors that are involved in, in autism. So the other thing that's really related to autism is exposure to glyphosate. And so Stephanie Seneth has done a lot of work on this topic and she works at MIT in the AI um, department and is just, she, she is, I could, I just love her. I, I'm so grateful for her work because she has documented what we all see in our clinics that we don't have the time to document ourselves. And her documentation really is solid around exposure, the use of glyphosate and the rate of autism, it's parallel. And glyphosate is very toxic and it's spread you know, over the entire globe at this point. So we have to be very active in avoiding that. And that's part of the educational process. And that doesn't happen overnight either, which is why we would ideally would like you know, several months to get that out of our houses, out of our bodies. And glyphosate goes away pretty, pretty rapidly actually when you avoid it, it can be gone, not detectable within a week. Yeah, gosh, I love that. And, and the encouragement, because there's some things like MTBEs, which are like, you know, mm -hmm. so some of these things are fairly quick to get rid of if you just don't get exposed, right? Like at the core, right. 
decreased exposure is is one of the principles versus we often, if you're listening, you might think, oh my gosh, what's my toxic load? What do I have to do? It's super complex. Yes. But just clean air, clean water, clean food can exactly. be huge. Um, yeah. I have a little interesting story about glyphosate too, because I remember after my mold exposure, um, I was like, oh, I got to test my glyphosate and see what's up. I had been eating organic for probably a decade, like almost a hundred percent. And I thought, oh, I'll be super clean and great. And I remember you might've heard me tell this. I was uh, three times the level of a study with farmers on on application day, meaning they had just applied it. So I was like, what in the world? Like it was really high. And this was before we had standardized access. It was a lab that was just doing research. So they compared the levels of the people who put in their urine samples to different studies. And so I was like on the dots on the graph, I was three times higher than any of the study levels. Wow. So, yeah. So, and of course I got that out of my body, but I really think I have two dogs. I'm in a condo where I don't control the lawn care and they sleep oh, yeah. day, and the dogs sleep with me. Um, uh -huh. And the spray, you know, we found out organic wines in California have traces of glyphosate. So it's not safe to just have organic. So I, I mean, I think the dogs were part of it. So taking your shoes off when you enter the house, right? Your dogs are clean and not walking on glyphosate grass. And, but it's right. amazing, right? Because I would have thought that I would have been the role model of, of someone who had low glyphosate. And here I was not at all. And probably my detox pathways were not great either. But was that from what they were spraying where you were living? Not from your it diet. Been pat I don't think, I mean, it's hard. I really don't know. I don't think I had much dietary exposure um, mm -hmm. because I was really careful about organic. Um, the dogs were my first thought. Um, could it have been past exposure? Because I would grew up on a farm where glyphosate was everywhere when I grew mm -hmm. up. Now, like I said, they're GMO free and they, so they don't spray glyphosate at all. But at the time, I, I don't know. I don't, do you know how long it lasts in your system? Like, I think it it's out pretty quickly. So that must have been an ongoing exposure, maybe yeah. from your the grass and the dogs, like you said. I think that's and all. Maybe I happened to test like right after they sprayed, right? You know, it might have been just timing thing because ever since then I've been like zero undetected. Yeah. So it's been oh, good. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So yeah. that is, I mean, I always, what I really want to impart to people is as heavy as this information is, trust me, I was a little depressed writing this book. It's kind of heavy. It's kind of overwhelming. But the truth is there is a lot in our control like this. And this, this goes away quickly. Heavy metals take a long time to come out. Yeah. Mold is a little in, in between depending on you know how healthy you are and what your genetic um, landscape looks like but um, some of this stuff really can can shift quickly and I, I walk through personal care products and what we can do about that and just really it does take time to go through a home and identify the things that are putting you at risk and and there's now compared to 20 years ago there are so many amazing products available yes. i'm astounded so there's almost no excuse and you know these are not expensive anymore they used to be really out of reach financially for a lot of people and now you know we also know that vinegar and water are really mm -hmm. great cleaning supplies so so I try to give people really um, manageable suggestions and um, things that will work for every person I love that. I can't wait for this book because it's going to be such a big um, deal for patients, for my patients too. So I'm excited. And right now there's no for sure the timeline's a little bit. No. Yeah, I, yeah, just, I know how this goes. <laughs> I, just want to I know. I wish I could say, yeah, maybe I come back when it's ready. I don't know. I, I oh, wish absolutely. I could say <laughs> it was ready. But I mean, the, the other reason I wrote this book was that I'm, I've been seeing, I'm sure you have too, so many people in their 40s and 50s with cognitive decline mm -hmm. and they're otherwise healthy. And that to me is, you know, I, if I had one tattoo, it would be why, yes. why does this 40 year old have cognitive decline? That doesn't make any sense. And I really backed it up to, well, they probably came in with a lot of this. And so if we want to change the generation coming behind us, we want them to come in healthier. And so it's an educational process and we're get we're get there. And I'm sure you talk about the cord blood studies that showed like yeah. babies being born into the world. Is it like greater than 200 chemicals able to be detected in their cord blood? And I think 180 80 of those were um, neurologically toxic. And oh so, my goodness. Oh, so, so yeah. I mean, and we don't know how they act together. Right. So nobody's studied that. And so, you know, we used to think of this placenta as this magic gate and the placenta is just as porous as the, mm -hmm. um, the, the brain barrier. Yeah. So we have to assume that anything that we are exposed to or have stored will be shared with the fetus at some point. And so that's a big motivator for a lot of people to think, okay, I can't just get away with this because it's going to get to the baby where they say, you know, this drug is a yeah. class C drug and it's pregnancy safe, but it still gets to the baby. Right. Exactly. So you have to really be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, well, in our last few minutes, I'd love to just briefly talk about mold because you and I both have stories. Yes. I won't go into mine, but I, I had my <laughs> office 
totally yes. from old, had to leave and start over and you had something similar. Tell us just a little bit about your story. It's and very similar, very similar. I, I was in a, um, an office in Boulder that I was in for six years mm -hmm. and every day that I, I don't work every day. And so it wasn't like I could track it. And I thought, oh, I just have low blood sugar, but I would have these visual changes. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the day, I couldn't read my own writing. It was so impaired. And I would often drive home feeling like I had been drinking and then couldn't sleep and anxiety, depression, insomnia, um, which it, none of that is normal for me. And so this was 2017 and we did an air spore trap test in the office because all of our patients that are mycotoxic kept coming in saying, why am I dizzy in here? Or I have had a headache for three days since being in your office. We're like, that doesn't make any sense. This is clean. The, the air spore trap test was, was negative. And then we did a dust sample and it was off the charts. Wow. So then we had it cleaned and I couldn't go back in after it was cleaned because I would get dizzy every time I went back in. And I'm pretty healthy. Yeah. Previous to this, I have been very strong and resilient and healthy. And like I have exercised, you know, I've been a runner for 30 years and came in fourth in the Boulder Boulder years ago. Wow. Like, you know, I've, I've been pretty strong, but I went down hard. And, you know, I had tested my HLA-DR in 2015. And then I said, oh my God, that's funny. I have that gene. I've laughed it off. <laughs> and then I, then I was like, oh my gosh, now I, now I see, you know, in my MTHFR, I have one SNP. And so, you know, you put all these pieces together in the rear view mirror when you're sick and you think, yeah. oh, okay. And then, you know, the, I do believe there's a gift in every single illness. I mean, look what your gifts have been, this journey that you're on and where you are. Um, would you ever chosen that? No, right. but it has, you know, really honed my skills at working with mycotoxic patients and detox in general. And so, um, you know, I got through it. I, I still have a little, a little bit of residual. I've just been lazy. I need to clean up. But for the oh. most part, it took six months to find a spot in Boulder that didn't have mold in it because we had a flood here and there's, you know, so many Lots of properties. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. And so, yeah, we have a clean office, which, you know, I'm super happy about. And I love it. Better. I have to come see your new space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To do it. Um, well, yeah, very similar um, story that everybody's heard of my own as well. And what I think that was interesting is I've had a lot of colleagues who, they're mostly colleagues, a few friends, a few patients that have had infertility or miscarriages. And we later find out they had massive mold exposure. Mm -hmm. So it, as we're talking about fertility and that, this could be an issue too, if you're having infertility issues or if you've had multiple miscarriages, um, mm -hmm. mycotoxins are teratogenic, so they can cause birth defects. And they look, it's funny because a lot of the studies, because they affect grain production and then cow, like uh, livestock really. Right. A lot of the studies around mycotoxins and mold are done in um, cattle and in pigs, but it's super clear that it has a fertility effect and it has an effect to the fetus. So mm -hmm. this is a really big deal too. And this is one that you may or may not know. So one thing I've seen with COVID is as people are at home more, when their home is toxic, all of a sudden I've seen people are like, oh, I'm getting so sick, right? No, I was so worried about this. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, know, you seen like, more people who are noticing because they're all of a sudden they're at home and their home is moldy? Yes, 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 yes. And I, you know, early on in the in the pandemic, I thought, oh no, all these people are going to be stuck yeah. at home. Yes. And this was, you know, still winter, so the windows were closed, yeah. and I was really worried and about that. And did you see that a few people got worried? I mean, I saw not yeah. not tons, but maybe a ten percent or so of yes. people that really got sick. But it was kind of interesting because, like, well, what changed in March? Oh, and so they would kind of the buy-in for them was easier because, like, oh yeah, I've been home a lot. Yeah, I've been I've right. been worse. So they kind of put it together because part of the issue with mold is for the patient to actually believe there's a real issue, right? Oh, for sure, for sure. And um, you know, I I think you've probably seen the same number of people with mycotoxicity and cancer diagnoses. Yes. And when they're really trying, when they try to unpack, like, why did I get this? Why, why, why? And it's like, well, let's look, let's just do a little dust sample of your house. I mean, we not need to look too far. Right. So yeah, it's, it's, you know, mold is insidious and quiet. And it touches every area of our lives, quite honestly, I think it does. Sadly, I know, don't you? I, I remember the very beginning, I'm like, well, not everything's mold. But then as I would dig, I kept finding these cases that were presenting with autoimmunity or neurodegenerative, like we said, Alzheimer's or dementia, or they were yes. massive chronic fatigue or migraine headaches. And I kept finding, like, gosh, is everything mold? And it's not, but there's an awful lot of it that goes yeah. undiagnosed, right? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually kind of glad when I see somebody with MS and I go, you might not have MS, you're presenting right. like that, but it might just be really treatable mold, which I don't, I don't mean to take it lightly because it's very yeah. destructive to your house or your office or whatever, but at least it's treatable. It, at least it's not something that's happening to you that nobody has an explanation for. So I love it. At least it's a layer. 
it's absolutely a layer, if not the top cause. That's kind of I how I get it. Totally agree. Yeah. And then the fertility, say you have a woman, a young woman comes up, hey, Dr. Shackleton, I want to get pregnant. I've heard you're great at this. I want to know what you want me to do. And then as you talk to her, maybe just do some testing and you, you find out she has mold in her home. How would you, would you treat that pretty similar as far as uh, detox for a year? What would you do with that patient for a pregnancy? I would say we want to retest and get a negative mycotoxin test before you conceive. Yeah. So, you know, take all the steps that we do to clean the house, remediate in every way possible, and then treat for six to 12 months, depending on the burden and see how she's doing. But I think it's, you know, as we both know, you can clean it up. Yeah. You just got to know how. Yes, absolutely. Right? So that's one of those things that, you know, is a blessing in disguise. Like, oh, this is what it is. And it's super treatable. It's just going to be a pain for about a year. It is a pain in the butt, but it's very <laughs> Yeah. I feel like you said, it's, it's a huge blessing because I all my knowledge comes from, I mean, not all, there's a study afterwards, but as far as my interest, I always joke because I was like, I'm not going to treat Lyme or mold. Well, guess what? <laughs> we kind of have yeah. to treat both and that might be the majority of my practice because there's so many people who aren't doing right. those two things. Probably similar for you, right? I remember reading the word stachybotrys. I, I, so my master's in public health, we look at, I took a toxicology class where they really were talking about environmental disasters like the Minamata Bay mercury contamination and then subsequent mercury poisoning of the people in Japan. So we looked at that kind of stuff, but never this like in low grade environmental exposures, chronic exposures. Um, so um, wait, where was I going with that? Sorry, the brain. Oh no, yeah, with um, exposures and toxicity and, and um, I think, <laughs> it's Friday, <laughs> um, we were talking about women getting pregnant and chronic low-lying exposures. Oh, you're talking your public health and just how it's so insidious and you were seeing, oh, stachybotry is the word. Oh, thank you, thank you. So, I, so I, I remember reading that word thinking, oh, I don't ever want that. And boom, got it. And then that, the one in your, that was one in my office too. <laughs> yep. I was like, Ooh, I don't think I'm ever, am I just associated with East coast? You know, that's a big myth is that you can't have mold in Colorado cause it's so dry here. Well, it's an epidemic here. It and is. It is. so, yeah, you know, whatever you don't want, be careful because you're going to attract that on some yeah. level. <laughs> yeah. I never, I would say I, I never chose to treat mold. It chose me. I was like, yeah. I gotta do this. But, exactly. oh, this is so fun. I love it. Um, tell us a little bit. Well, we talked about where they can find you, but go ahead and repeat those websites for everybody. So the clinic website is Holistica Care, H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C-A-C-A-R-E.com. And then my blog is on maryshackleton.com. Awesome. I'll be sure and share those links. Um, any last words of wisdom? I mean, people are still amidst a little bit of chaos. The kids are starting to go back to school, some of them. Um, what's the, any bit of advice you'd like to leave us all with? I, I think right now, and this is just my personal feeling because I love summer and spring so much, but to be outside as much as possible right now. I mean, we do have a pretty big forest fire here right now, so the air quality is not great. So if you have asthma, don't listen to me. But, you know, to be outside as much as possible right now because it helps recalibrate everything about us and to counteract the wireless exposure that we're having. And um, that that's kind of, you know, the things that do the things that you can do and then be really gentle on the stuff that you don't feel good about right now and just be, be kind in your mind. Those are my kind oh, of Oh, I love it. Be kind people. in your mind. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yes. well, thank you, Dr. Shackleton. It has been a treat to talk to you today. Thank you. So fun to see you. And we, we are literally just a few miles apart, but we never see each other. So hopefully that'll change. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank Take you care. for having me. You're welcome.